Okay, I think it is time to start. Um, we are short one of our panelists. So if anyone spots uh, Mohammed Razim lurking around. Um, aha, we have a full house. Fantastic. Hey, man. Hello. Um, so yeah, let's kick off. Um, we've only got 45 minutes, so uh, there's plenty to discuss. So hello, welcome to Drupalcon Europe 2021 distributions panel. Um, this panel is a session where we'll be discussing four of our distributions, three, four distributions. Um, we're exploring some common issues that we face and sharing some insights on in how we address them. Um, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves in a moment, but uh, first, um, I am Finn from Agile Collective, Finn Lewis. We're a Drupal company based in Oxford, UK, working with public sector and private sector, uh, sorry, non-profit sector um, people in the, in, the, in the open source world. Um, I'm joined by three other panelists actively growing and maintaining distributions. I'm a little bit of background on how this came about. Um, we've been working with uh, the local Gov Drupal distribution over the last two years. And at DrupalCon Europe 2020, uh, we had a presentation um, sharing what we've learned, um, rapidly learned on our, on our journey into distributions, uh, out of which we had a, a, a boff about, about distributions, um, where we decided to continue the discussion throughout the year with a, with a monthly meetup. Um, so this meetup has been running every month over the last year. Um, and we continue to learn an awful lot uh, about distributions from, from each other. Um, so this uh, panel session seemed like a logical extension and a uh, chance to encourage more collaboration between uh, distributions, but also between uh, the wider community and distributions. Um, we've got a poll running on the, on, on the, uh, on the, the poll thing, uh, just to try and gauge a little bit about who the audience are, how technical you are, whether you're developers, product managers, these kind of things. So um, yeah, if you can, if you can uh, answer the poll, that would be great. Um, and we are welcoming, we are welcoming questions, uh, a Q and A, and hopefully we'll have time to uh, time to delve into those. Um, so if we could just kick off with a, a quick round of introductions, um, if I could ask you each to introduce yourself and give a quick summary of your distribution and and who it's for. And I think we'll go to Nick first, if that's all right. Hey, good morning, afternoon, evening, depending on the time zones that everybody is in. Eh? Um, so my name is Nick. I'm the, the CTO of Drop Solid, and um, I'm here in the representation of Drop Solid Rocket Ship, which is a distribution that is being used by uh, Drop Solid itself, but also our partners for building um, amazing digital experiences, quote unquote. Uh, that's the, the, the marketing term. But in um, yeah, effect, it's actually best practices of Drupal by then also adding marketing automation and personalization for lead capturing, nurturing, et cetera, et cetera. But more about that, I think, in a bit. Uh, thanks, Nick. And Daniel? Hey. Uh, yeah, I'm Daniel. Uh, I work for Borda. That's a German uh, magazine publishing company. And as such, our distribution is aimed at magazine publishing companies. Um, and uh, our focus is more on the editorial experience. We do not provide any front end as such. And uh, and it's not meant to be a turnkey solution uh, because within our company, many different uh, versions of Thunder exist that have been developed uh, in parallel and to a certain degree with uh, local or with different uh, aims. So uh, usually it's just the base for our projects and not the turnkey solution. Excellent. Thanks, Anu. And Mohamed, hi. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Mohamed Razem. I'm the CEO of Vardot, a Drupal agency doing Drupal work since um, 2011. And the distribution we built um, is called Varbase. It's a starter kit distribution. Uh, we started it since Drupal 7 and updated it to Drupal 8 and 9. It, it is, um, it is uh, currently maintained and it was built for us as a company to build uh, different uh, Drupal projects for our customers. It is open source, so it's available for everyone. And it um, uh, kind of bridges um, both the editorial experience and some of the best practices and opinionated decisions that we think of certain contributed modules and configuration Drupal, along with uh, Bootstrap as a front-end theme for uh, the distribution and building websites uh, uh, with it. 
Fantastic. Thanks, Mohammed. And, and just to, for, for completion, uh, I mean, I'm sort of facilitating this panel, but also representing local gov Drupal, which is uh, uh, an open source collaboration in the UK between councils um, to develop websites for their public facing websites. Um, and uh, again, is, is similar in, in such as uh, it's acting as a starter kit for, for councils to, to, you know, speed up the, the distribution of uh, the development process, um, but also to, to collaborate and act as a point of collaboration between councils. Um, so more about that uh, in a bit. Um, but um, first, first thing I wanted to focus on was just uh, the benefits of of using your distribution versus using a custom build. Um, um, it sounds like there's some commonalities of of, of you know a starter kit to, to rapidly um, get some functionality out there. But uh, there are some specific benefits I think in each of the distributions, which I guess speak to your audiences. Um, so maybe can we go to Daniel first? Um, what do you think the key benefits are? If you could summarize the benefits of your distribution. I think one of the uh, things that differentiates us from other distributions is that we really try to have uh, upgrade paths from one version to another version. So on the one hand, we are not uh, giving you everything, but the parts that we do give you, we guarantee you that you can up upgrade with new versions of the uh, of the distribution and even with new with changes of configuration that we might think are more appropriate uh, than they were before. And um, this also means that the set of modules that we provide will always be future proof. So we will always take care of being that everything of them is actually Drupal 9, Drupal 10 compatible. That uh, that any obstacles that might be that might occur in between that with this with this set of modules you are safe from our side that you will continue to use them or we will find a solution to replace them as easy as possible if that wouldn't be possible I think that is our main main proposal um, that we take that, care that, of a subset that's... of things that everyone uses and that will be updatable, guaranteed. And it's interesting for, for you because your main audience are, are internal uh, publishers within the Berlin yes. group. So you kind of yes. have direct contact with a lot of your, your main stakeholders. Um, and I think, Nick, that's a bit different different for you or, or that particular yeah. benefit is not, <laughs> what, what are the key benefits for your district? Yes, it's indeed very different. Uh, so as you mentioned, it's indeed uh, kind of like a starter kit, um, but the starter kit is meant for uh, companies, but also here internally to get the competitive advantage as in the end uh, user expects a certain base uh, functionality. And that expectation kind of went up and up and up and up in the last years as in uh, it needs to be what you see is what you can get um, or what you get and uh, not can get. Um, it needs to be connected to all kinds of APIs of internal architecture uh, or internal uh, tools. Um, also needs to be able to add capabilities like marketing automation and personalization but still also the technical people wants to be, uh, want to be uh, happy with what they actually serve to that um, yeah, company. The other benefits or the, the biggest two things that are different from main, like many distributions that are out there is one multilingual, as in it uh, adds a whole bunch of modules necessary for Drupal to really function as a multilingual distribution. Um, talking about asymmetric translations, um, a bunch of, menu tweaks and, and other stuff that yeah, is not completely out of the box with Drupal itself. And on the other hand, it's the uh, editing experience or the editorial experience. We recently made a major shift from paragraphs into layout builder. So it's more into the front end as in uh, what you see is what you get in terms of structured content blocks. Uh, so it's different from Gutenberg and all those things. It's still possible to connect it to a content hub or a content API or anything else to have automated content, but still also allow the content editor to enrich that information in the way that we all yeah, love about Drupal, which is structured content. So that's, I think, the, the major things where Rocketship um, is able to shine. Excellent. Thanks, Nick. Um, and, and Mohammed, how about uh, Varbase and, and uh, yeah, what are the key, key benefits? Sure. So we, we started var based with the whole idea that we don't want to repeat ourselves so back when we implemented var based on drupal 7 it started as a way to establish some standards some basic configurations and throughout the years it just snowballed with a lot of requirements and certain enhancements 
modules that we use them as a standard de facto modules that should be included in a Drupal website. So nowadays, um, the whole goal and the whole benefit is that every project or every website should be built with less effort than the previous one. Uh, it should be implemented much quicker. And um, ultimately, the, the whole benefit is it speeds the time to market. I think uh, similar to uh, what Nick mentioned, um, we, we do focus also on the Layout Builder. Recently made the shift from paragraphs to Layout Builder. As I mentioned, since we focus also and we package Varbase with a front-end theme or a base theme, which is built on Bootstrap, so we are able to harness Bootstrap and Layout Builder modules to build you know, mobile-ready, responsive, uh, different uh, uh, in include also the, the Bootstrap components as well. It also has some multilingual features, uh, editorial experience in the backend features. And I think the benefit that we as a company or anybody who would use Varbase, um, I would summarize it that commercially, it allows us to separate the, um, the roles uh, of a site builder and a back or a Drupal developer because it's you know it's easier to find uh, site builders and as a commercial company sometimes we want to build faster websites bigger websites quicker so um, having varbase now maybe 90 or 95 percent of the time is only spent by a site builder who builds the site because there's it just packages a lot of the features out of the box without the need to build those custom uh, features Interesting. Yeah. So a, a lot of commonality there around the editorial experience and uh, making that as good as possible and also getting as far as we can uh, out of the box as a starting point uh, to not reinvent wheels, not, not redo the same thing. A lot of that is very similar in, in local gov trying to make, make it as, uh, as easy as possible for the, for the content uh, editors to, to, to manage, including things like, you know, workflow, which I know is standard in, I think, most of the distributions, especially in, in, in Thunder kind of content lifecycle uh, type of stuff. Um, so thinking about challenges then, because this is where I think maybe it starts to get, get a bit more interesting, um, and this is where maybe we have more to learn from each other. Um, what are the biggest challenges in, in, in your distribution? If we go to Daniel first on that. Well, if you want to be updatable, then this is the biggest challenge, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> um, but um, if we take that out of out of the uh, equation. Um, in the beginning, it changed over the years, I would say. In the beginning, it was getting a Drupal up and running at all, a uh, distribution up and running and all. Then the uh, how, how can we make sure that all the projects that now run on this uh, distribution get the updates that we intend to have them? That was the second biggest problem. Currently, we are, and maybe that leads to some other questions, um, currently, we are running more the challenge that how and who decides what should be in the distribution. So what features do we actually want or what features do our, uh, our customers actually want? Before, there was many technical things that had to be solved. That was more or less our problem. And um, yeah, this I think in the last few years this changed to what do we actually, how do we actually get the features that we want? And by the way, one of the trade-offs of our um, of our way of doing it is that we do not have that many features as others might have, because the more features you have, the more you would have to make sure that they are all updatable and all maintained. Um, uh, so this juggling would be getting worse. So we do not have so many features, but still those features that we do add, how do we decide what those features are and how they should be implemented or how they should be shown and, to the and do you, editor. Do you, do, you, do you have an answer to that? What's your current process for for, for making that call? I, I, have an, I have a process. I don't know if that's the answer, but uh, for, uh, for, for, for our company, it was um, the challenge that the different um, brands are very separated from each other. So they all use our distribution, but the, the product management is completely separated. And still they have the same requirements specifically for, well, they have similar products, uh, but uh, it's 
still the same uh, requirements, but in different directions. And and we decided that we should have a kind of um, uh, organization where all the product managers of all those brands sit together with us and we define features that are common for all together and then put them in our backlogs and then uh, priority prioritize them and implement them. So we have a, a gremium of several uh, product managers under our uh, umbrella, the Thunder Committee, we called it, and we decide together what should be done uh, on, the, on the distribution and what is not part of the distribution, but part of the specific project. That that is that is really interesting actually, and I think that let's just run with that theme for for a moment because um, that's that's very similar to the local gov Drupal distribution, which is a, a collaboration of councils, and so there isn't really necessarily uh, sort of one person making the decision on what should go in. It's very much a collabor co collaboration, and and uh, in, in a similar way, a sort of a, a product group comes together, or the idea is a product group will come together and you know help to decide what the next features are and make sure that the roadmap is clear between the stakeholders involved. So um, similar crossover there with, with Thunder. Um, but maybe just running on that theme of that question around uh, uh, how the features get decided. Um, Mohammed, can we go to you? Um, how, how does it work for, for Varbase? Yeah, uh, from our end, it's easy. We It's kind of um, centralized. So uh, I would say almost 95% of the new feature and enhancements and requirements that come up, uh, they come up from Vardot, so uh, from the projects that we build. And ultimately, myself, I am the... Um, product owner of the distribution. So it comes down to me and of course the product team when we just discuss what kind of features would go into uh, Varbase versus a feature that can just be implemented in a you know custom way on a project, uh, not in the distribution itself. So um, yeah, it's um, it comes down to centralized kind of decision-making process. For the other 5% of the features, uh, in terms of the quantity of features, they come up from the community. So we do get sometimes uh, requests for new features, uh, whether enhancements or fully loaded ideas. Uh, they come from the Drupal issue queue or from our Slack workspace. And uh, yeah. Uh, bubbling up, but ultimately you, you get to make the call on, on which ones, which things are going in. Um, it uh, sounds sounds efficient. <laughs> um, and Nick, what about what about for Drop Drop Solid and uh, and Rocket Ship? Yeah, I, th I think I wanted to go back to your initial question in terms of the the challenges as well. So yeah, we could talk about the feature uh, additions, which is one thing. Um, the, the challenges, and, and we spoke about that with Daniel before in the the pre preparement. Um, what Daniel does really well in terms of the upgradability, that's our biggest challenge. Uh, um, currently, and, and you can see that also on Drupal.org, we're still on alpha mode, not because it's not stable, it's because we didn't want to commit to the upgrade pod. Um, and that's a very tricky, tricky thing uh, because indeed it's a boilerplate, um, but how, for example, and maybe I can ask this as well to Mohammed, how do you support websites that came from paragraphs and then you move into layout builder and then have an upgrade pod? Uh, I'm not entirely sure if you would support that, but we decided no. <laughs> we we don't have an upgrade path from from that really specific configuration to another, and then also in that time the entire teaming layer, the front end layer, completely got overhauled, and then new technologies got embedded in there. And then uh, to go also back to the other question, how do you decide how to like who adds features or what do you add? Um, we actually had more features in the previous version of the distribution than we have now. And so we had blogs and photo gallery and contact and um, there was uh, events and all that stuff uh, in the new version. It's just basic pages with layout builder building landing pages. And then internally, we have instructions how to build these kind of features so that there is like a roadmap or like a, a tutorial for starters to build specific customizations on top of the distribution instead of automating these functionalities in the distribution. So we're now basically in the crossroad of deciding what else do we need to take out in order to go to a distribution where we can actually upgrade, like upgrade this on a longer period of time. If that makes Interesting. sense. Interesting. So, so that is that is an ultimate goal of, of yours then to get to the point where 
you know, at the moment you've managed to jump very quickly from one version to another version yeah. to bring in lots of new layout builder and other features because yeah. you're iterating you're, you're rapidly, not, breaking not things yeah, the, the Google way, <laughs> yeah. uh, as, as they say. But you would like to get to a point where it is a longer term distribution that, that, that your, your people are using it would be able to continue to upgrade from, from major yes. version to major version. Yeah, and another challenge that we had there is that when Rocket Chip started, I think Drop Solid had 40 people headcount ish, uh, and it was a lot easy to go, okay, yes, no, yes, no, ah, uh, yeah, useful, ah, uh, the developer uh, changes. Now we're more than double the headcount and then have more people within management that didn't come from a Drupal background. And then making sure that they also understand what are the risks and, and what are the, the upgrades, what problems, and why can't we go from paragraphs to later builder? It's a very technical discussion, eh? but you need to explain that also to a client that sees the layout builder stuff in a demo. And then you tell them, well, no, it's not possible for your site. Uh, um, yeah, those are tricky, tricky things that we're now having as a challenge. Uh, sure. And I see Mohammed nodding, so I, I think it's very similar for for him. Eh? And, and and I guess this this kind of highlights uh, one of the things we were talking about before, which is the 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 way that Drupal distributions on the one end are a starter kit and like I said, a recipe to to just get you going quickly and to build on top of you know kind of maybe developer focused more you know kind of a something that needs some work in order to build, build out a, a full site. And on the other end of the spectrum are things like open social and products that are fully. Uh, productized, maybe software as a service, and not meant to be changed at all, and therefore the upgrade path is easier. And it seems like, I mean, there's well, there's a definite leaning towards the starter kit for you know for, for a few of us, but we're somewhere in the middle. There is that kind of crossover where some people do want to continue to upgrade and get new features, but at the same time we want to start, and that's that's kind of where the divergence becomes a, an interesting, yeah. an interesting yeah, and question. The, the difficulty, I think, lies also in the fact that there's no longer a hard cap on the end of life of a Drupal version, and so. You have to be very conscious about the fact that this website that you're building probably can outlive you in theory. Huh? Um, in practice, nobody knows, obviously, but it's very different from you know, when we started with Drupal 7, knowing that things are about, like, a lot more disruptive and it stopped the train and a new thing. Um, the world also changed. Huh? The, the software, the websites Drupal builds now are probably more than just a blog. Uh, so, I mean, in my opinion, at least that is a. Uh... Absolutely, absolutely. And so, so I mean, maybe just sticking on this theme of the um, the the upgrade ability, that you know, trying to to create an upgrade path. Uh, I mean, Daniel Thunder, uh, as you said, does does support that upgrade path. Um, so, how how do you go about that when we're talking about divergent configuration? We're talking about these 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 technical challenges where we're not quite sure where the, the people are using the distribution where they have got to where they've diverged to yet we still want to give them you know a, a way to upgrade so is there anything anything you can share about your your experience with that yeah it's actually two important things i think one is make sure that there is not much of an upgrade necessary so you can have features without an upgrade it's just another module um uh, and uh, the other is if there is if there is an upgrade necessary, and I'm talking about configuration updates. I'm not talking about code updates because code updates should be solved. Um, if there is a configuration update where we where we see okay, it's necessary to change the default configuration that you installed with um, because there was a mistake or you cannot or well, we want you to use something else now as a field widget, for example. Um, what we do then is test uh, the existing active configuration of that project in uh, Drush UpDB uh, if it's the expected value from us, if it has exactly that field widget configured that we put there first. And if that is the case, then change it to whatever we want it to be now. Um, uh, uh, and if it is not, then just tell the developer, okay, we try to update this, we couldn't because we found we didn't find the expected ex uh, configuration. If you want to do it manually, take a look at the configuration page here and see what you can do yourself. So it should be not too disruptive if you have made different choices than we did. We don't care if you add some field because we don't know about the field, we will not update the field. But um, but in cases where we know, okay, 
this should be changed now, and we know how it should have been, then we have this update helper module that would uh, just check configuration and diff configuration and then change it if possible. And it's for us, it's quite convenient. And uh, because to go to several projects and just manually change the configuration just because we added that and we want all of our project to have that wouldn't def uh, would defeat the purpose of Thunder for us as a company to uh, to get those changes quickly out. Interesting, yeah, and that, that's something I know we've we've discussed a few times during the uh, the the meetups over the year, and it's certainly a, a hot topic for for distributions. Um, Mohammed, I think you you had um, a similar approach, uh, or slightly different, some of the kind of custom configuration optional management. Exactly, yeah, I think we. Um, we try to think of updates into four types of updates. So there's an update that is what we call a forced update. Whether you like it or not, you're getting that update. It's a fix. It's a code update. Uh, sometimes it's just a security update. And also when it comes to configuration, there are some forced configuration updates that we think the site better have that configuration rather than not have it. And... Um, with that, we just use update hooks and just run those updates. The second part is what we call an optional update, which what Daniel mentioned. I think this is, um, we also learned a lot from what Thunder did in a module called Update Helper. So we actually use this module in Varbase. We did change it a little bit. We tried to patch it. I think there's an, um, a patch that's not yet committed. Maybe we can collaborate uh, later to uh, allow it. Uh, to give some kind of a user interface for end users to see which updates, optional updates, are available for the user. So optional updates could be a simple, you know, we recommend that you enable this new module that we think could be useful for your site. Or we recommend that um, this CK editor or WYSIWYG button uh, can help you in, in your editor. So we do the same way uh, Daniel mentioned. We check if the existing config has changed if not, we, um, the user can just pull this update from the UI. If not, they must run some kind of a drush command with dash dash force to override the existing config and just take it, obviously, with, with the user's own uh, intention. So the last two types of updates, um, it's not really a type of update, but there's no update. Sometimes we just, you know, uh, we don't, um, it's a new install that we don't think that uh, this should be uh, updating uh, an existing site. It can come with a new site, but it shouldn't be part of an existing site. And an example of that is uh, what Nick mentioned from Layout Builder and Paragraphs. For instance, we do not provide an upgrade path. I think it's very hard to provide an upgrade path from Paragraphs to Layout Builder. So what we did is actually we did two separate content types, one for Paragraphs and one for Layout Builder. So even existing sites can have both options enabled. And it just, you know, we tell people that the paragraphs is legacy while the layout builder is new. And maybe after two or three releases of Varbase, we just deprecate paragraphs and it's no longer going to be available. The last hard uh, challenge in updates is actually updating the code of Drupal um, of Drupal and of the distribution itself. I'll give you a very quick example of this challenge, which is, for instance, updating uh, the media or migrating the media when media was included in core. This was a hefty update. Uh, there ha it has to be staggered updates. So you cannot jump directly to the most recent version of media. You need to jump to the latest contrib media version and then do the update hooks and then jump to, th to the core update. Similarly, sometimes we make decisions in the distribution where we include certain modules that we maybe after two or three release releases, we decide to deprecate and remove. So these types of updates, we have built a custom tool. Uh, it's called Varbase Updater, where we kind of specify certain rules that allows the user to just run an update command and it would walk them through. Think of it as a wizard in the, in the terminal, where just in step number one, you need to um, update to this version first, run the update hooks, and then step number two, run to, to the next version. So it just kind of uh, simplifies the update process in, an, um, uh, in a way that we don't think it's perfect, but it 
works. And this is where the last challenge that we think is, um, you know, update is, is a very big challenge. So, and I think it's very important for, for the distribution, all the distributions to come together to try to fix this issue because this is one of the biggest negative perception of distributions is that if I start with a distribution and that distribution later on, I cannot update it, then you know what? I'm just, I, I don't want to start with a distribution. I want to start with Drupal core. So a lot of people have negative perception from distribution because there's no proper update paths and it becomes kind of messy uh, for the updates. So yeah, I, I think that this is a very important challenge that should be addressed. Maybe to uh, add right. one thing to, yeah. to that, if it's okay. Um, it, yeah. We had indeed exactly the same challenge. And one of the quote unquote fixes that we had there is that we call it an end of life script for a specific version of distribution. The thing what that script did is it moved all the modules that was in the contract folder into the custom folder. And then suddenly it's no longer managed by an external system like Drupal.org, uh, but it's the responsibility of the project uh, as a whole. Um, and then the, yeah, the, the coder modules and uh, everything else to like fix code snippets here and there to be Drupal 9 compatible suddenly are the responsibility of the people developing the project instead of the distribution maintainers itself. Um, it's not perfect as well, but we didn't see any other approach um, in order to still allow the website or the project to evolve into Drupal 9, et cetera, uh, while still allowing things to get deprecated. Interesting. And um, I, I guess I guess for, for you, Nick, um, the, 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 the core part of the gnarly problems that we're talking about updates don't necessarily come in in the wider sense at the moment because you you don't support an update from one major version to the next but in the future all of these problems are stuff that that, that you're going to face as well in in, in rocket ship and uh, i'm assuming from what you were said and so uh if we yeah, can... yeah and it's tricky yeah, deprecations as as Mahat mentioned i think that one of the biggest issues there is that you have to go from version to version because in the the version that comes you cannot remove the module yet but you can disable it and then in the version after that, you can remove the code base. But if you skip two versions, suddenly the code to remove the, the, the configurations is no longer there. And uh, Drupal goes entirely crazy. Uh, Drupal cannot handle uh, removals of modules if they're not there. Yeah. And so, but that's a general Drupal problem. And yeah, maybe that's a more generic solutions. thing. That's <laughs> well, true. Um, this then, <laughs> then points to the kind of question which which we we haven't really discussed in, in our pre pre talks, but um, but around how Drupal Core could better support distributions It's something we touched on a bit early on in the year after the last uh, Drupal DrupalCon Europe. Um, and I know the configuration initiative has changed things massively for, for to Drupal 8 and those problems that we we know of Drupal 6 and 7 getting stuck in a sort of open atrium based distribution extended and everything just breaks because you can't do updates is is somewhat mitigated by uh, you know using composer to manage uh, core and contrib separately from the distribution which is mainly an install profile with a few bits of custom code um, but then we still got these problems going forward with, with you know with kind of like gnarly problems around updates as, as core evolves so is, it, is there anything that we know of that actually Drupal core can do to help distributions uh, be more maintainable um, I think uh, Nick I'm just going to start with you on that because you, you kind of like maybe think of the question but uh, I know you've got a lot of experience it's, it's, you know, it's a good question um, and I, I think it's one of the, the challenges I'd love to tackle on a higher level is to include multilingualisms um, a, a lot further and a lot better in Drupal core itself, because it could remove some of the you know, issues that we need to solve in country plans and then also maintain on, on a longer period of time. On the other hand, I think the distribution downloads or the, the use of distributions on Drupal.org could use some improvements. Um, but I think maybe I'll leave that to Mohammed and Daniel to uh, uh, give their opinion about that as they're a bit more veterans in that front. Yeah, maybe I continue just because that would be my, my uh, complaint. It's basically not possible to actually distribute the distribution on Drupal.org correctly. So, so that's not a Drupal core problem, I guess. Or not, not, not just, um, but creating a tarball won't do it for us. So because we're relying on composer and multiple yes. packages from multiple places, yes. and so it's not, it's not like it used to be in one, one place. Yeah, 
So for us, uh, Drupal.org is the place where we, we communicate. There is a new version, and the version is there, but you can you cannot, I hope you cannot download the tarball or anything. Just uh, uh, just the instructions on how to compose or create your project. And this is kind of awkward, I think. <laughs> uh, so this would this would make a lot of difference. I know that there are several problems, especially with uh, dependencies that are not GPL correctly, uh, GPL uh, compatible or something like that, uh, especially uh, front end libraries and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, this is this is probably uh, what makes our life a little bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. For example, someone cannot download the entire distribution and run it. Yeah. Uh, and you can with Drupal itself. Uh, so there's uh, like a first party player and then uh, a like <laughs> sixth party player. And there's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not really good to uh, promote these kind of distributions on Drupal.org and like uh, show what Drupal is capable of in, in a wider sense other than the Umami demo. And I think, yeah, if we accept these different verticals and different industries and make those first party players, these distributions with obviously the, the licensing and all that stuff um, needs to be accommodated. But I think in the case of, of Thunder and also Varbase and, and Rocketship, most of that stuff is GPL plus maybe MIT plus I don't know what uh, should be possible to display the different type of licenses and different things because it's in Composer. Um, mm -hmm. Interesting. Mohammed, do you have anything on, on that as well? Yeah, I totally agree with uh, Nick and Daniel about the... So when it comes to promoting the distributions in a better way on Drupal.org, I think is something that is um, uh, definitely there are some really great distributions that can, um, whether they are um, starter kits or they are very specific use cases or what I call a fully featured distribution. So uh, this would help. I think also the the whole um, idea that there's, um, you can download an, a tarball at the same time you can, it, you what you should be doing is a composer create project. So I think drupal.org themselves probably for distributions specifically. This also applies for modules, but for distributions, it's more, um, there could be some kind of updates, enhancements done on Drupal.org itself to uh, make it easier for users to just know how to install these instead of providing a tarball that doesn't work. And yeah, I think um, lastly, maybe not Drupal core. I think this might be an, an um, a big dream or big idea. But um, we see a lot of other softwares built on PHP utilizing Symfony where they provide in their update process, again, going back to the update challenge, some kind of a checklist. You know, you run the Drush, let's say the Drush command in Drupal, and it just gives you a checklist that this is step number one, step number two, step number three, and then the update failed on this step or just proceeded to that step. Uh, for instance, also that but potentially could also be configurable. Like uh, the challenge of deprecations, we tried to implement it in a way where we would say, for instance, skip this module and don't update it or update to this version. And then once you run the update hooks, then move on to the next version. So I don't know if it's possible for maybe um, have a better configurable update manager for Drupal where distributions could use in terms of manage, you know, virgin updates and virgin upgrades in that sense, especially that Drupal is going full force with the uh, six month release cycle of new virgins and deprecations will always be part of normal life. Interesting, interesting suggestions, which maybe we can uh, yeah, take forward over over the year to come. Um, I just I just want to point out there is a Q&A on there. If anybody out there wants to fire any questions at the panel, um, feel free to write any. I don't think there are any in there yet. At least I can't see any. Um, but do do feel free to ask questions uh, there if, if that would help, uh, if you've got anything on your mind. Um, so uh, while we're just seeing if anybody does, I had a, a a little question which I wanted to ask each of you just around uh, Drupal Contrib modules in your distribution, whether you had a favorite Drupal Contrib module, uh, and if so, why? Just because I always learn a new thing every time I ask that question to people. Um, uh, I think, Mohammed, you you mentioned one uh, that, that I hadn't heard of. Um, yeah. 
I think there are two, you know, the obvious one is Layout Builder. Uh, the capabilities of Layout Builder are amazing. And I think uh, there's a lot of contributed modules that also make it even better and better. And um, it really bridges the gap between, you know, editorial experience for non-technical. So we really like, I really like Layout Builder and the suite of modules around it. The other thing that actually helped us a lot as um a company that maintains Drupal sites and, and just manages those uh, sites. Uh, there's a module that we actually forked. Um, it, it used to be called, um, I forgot what it used to be called, but now it's called Admin uh, Audit Trail. So it's a module that just logs every single thing in Drupal, whether you um, it's a failed login attempt or a successful login attempt and con uh, content has been edited by which user, when, and which IP in the admin interface in the report. So this gives, you know, it, I, I feel like it's a feature that's missing in Drupal, just to have a holistic admin audit trail. That is an interesting one. I haven't tried it. I, yeah, I was interested when I heard that. Um, uh, Nick, do you have any favorite contrib? Yeah, you asked me yesterday, so I, I did some <laughs> research in the, in the list uh, because there's so many like modules indeed. And just for reference, as I, I agree also with Mohammed on the Layout Builder, I pasted a, a screenshot of the Layout Builder modules that we use. Um, but I wanted to talk about Drimage, DR Image, um, which is a, a module that we recently discovered. Um, and for those that built uh, Drupal sites before and know the responsive image style module, um, maybe yeah, not if you, you know it, suddenly in your image style list, it, it's like gazillions of image styles yeah, because for every um screen size you have one and then updating one is a configuration challenge um and it's a pain in the uh yeah bleep but um dr image kind of solves that by removing all these image styles and it generates the image on the fly based on the screen size um i haven't delved into the technicality of it because uh, that's what my team actually does but they were really excited about removing all these configurations and removing all these responsive image styles um, and replacing it with the art image. Um, and also um, then Blazy got removed um, because uh, that was also one of the, the reasons why we had these different things. So it's simplifying things, deprecating modules. Um, mm -hmm. Very cool, thanks Nick. And uh, Daniel, do you have any favorite contrib? to complete the circle. I'm, I'm not sure about favorite, but um, but the, the latest one that we created might be interesting. <laughs> um, it's uh, it's called um, a media, media Library Media Modify. So it's a widget for a media library. Uh, uh, and what you can do with it, you can add, for example, in your article an image and change the image's values just for that article. So if you, so and you can decide which values you want to change and which values you want to leave basic, uh, the default, and um, then you can, for example, change the, I don't know, the the the, the title description, uh, or something like that, uh, because it has a different meaning in this context, and uh, or the or the the description anyway, because it in a in a in a, in a gallery. Or whatever you like, all fields that you have uh, for that media library, uh, media item, and it's quite quite nice because you don't change the actual media entity. Yeah, I'll be sure to check that out. Um, we've got a, a minute or so left. There are a couple of questions now in the Q and A. Uh, one from Antje saying, could there be something like an upgrade status module for distributions that would flag up where config has diverged from the default distribution and where an update would fail? Um, do you think that's is that is that a possibility? It's possible. <laughs> It's quite, possible. Quite, maybe. <laughs> a lot of work, but, it's possible. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, that, that kind of diffing the config, right? I guess. Yes. It's also tricky because I think that I need to, um, like to date upgrade status goes into individual modules on mm -hmm. its own and not the connection or the, the necessary glue between the specific versions of it. So somehow mm -hmm. I think you need to add like another abstraction layer to do differentiations between versions of the distribution that you're using and saying, yes, I follow or no, I won't follow. If you say, I'm not following, sure, it'll update all the individual ones at your own risk. If you do follow, well, then it's either this recipe or the next recipe, but nothing in a state in between because it will get you in trouble, uh, potentially. Uh, Interesting, um, yeah. So some complexity. I didn't think about that before, but yeah, maybe that's something we could work on. 
Um, I'm just going to quickly, because we've got about 10 seconds left, I don't know if it just cuts you off or not, but um, I just wanted to flag up that there is a distributions group on groups.drupal.org slash distributions, um, where we organize regular meetups every month. Um, so please come along to that. Uh, there is also a hashtag distributions channel on drupal.slack.com where we discuss all kinds of things. Um, so if people are interested in continuing the conversation, please do jump on both of those. Um, I think we're at time now, is that right? 45 minutes? I think that I think that's yeah, us. So sure. so look, thank you so much. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, Daniel. Um, it's been really good talking to you. Thank you for your time and your insights. And um, let's carry on with the conversation on Slack and at, at you know meetups, meetups coming up because I'm sure we've all got plenty more to talk about and uh, and collaborate on. And yeah, that's the that's the key thing here. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank See you. you. Soon. Bye. Bye.